Revelation 17. It's been said that the world is a spiritual red light district. On every corner, we are propositioned to take part in its spiritual adultery, to be unfaithful to God with the godless system and society that's opposed to him. I can give you everything you've ever wanted, the world tells us seductively. Everything your, your heart desires, pleasure, power, popularity, peace, prosperity, if you just get into bed with me, if you just give your heart to me. That's the proposition the world makes to each and every one of us each and every day. It promises to to make us feel happy, to make us feel secure, to make us feel important if we just cheat a little bit on our creator, on our commitment to him. A suggestion that, if we're honest, is very seductive and often very difficult to resist. Well, as we continue along in our study this morning of the revelation of Jesus Christ, we're going to see that in the future, the seduction will be stronger than ever. That during the seven-year tribulation period, most of the book describes the, the solicitation to spiritual adultery will be irresistible for most individuals. Most of the world's population, you could say, will be in bed with the anti-God system of this world. It's described here in chapter 17 to 18 as the great prostitute and designated Babylon, a title that has a long and consistently dishonorable history throughout the Bible. Genesis 11, the story of Babylon begins with the infamous Tower of Babel, built around 3000 BC under the leadership of Nimrod, great-grandson of Noah. And this, this tower meant many things. It was an act of organized sinful rebellion, God commanding humanity to go and fill the earth, and instead they stayed in one place to build this tower. It was also an act of organized selfish promotion. It says in, in Genesis 11, these rebels wanted to make a name for themselves, And finally, it was also an act of organized satanic religion, as towers like this were common in ancient pagan spirituality. Yet all of this, you know, didn't last long. God soon judged these people, confusing their language, scattering them abroad. But as they they went and began to fill the earth, they took with them this humanistic system of societal evil and spiritual error which comes out later in the writings of many of the Old Testament prophets and, of course, came to its climax in the Old Testament under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, who lived during the 600-year period of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which we read about in the book of Daniel. Now, that godless society was also ruined, but, but the same godless system nevertheless remained into the New Testament, where it's usually referred to rather as the world. That's the terminology Jesus uses, and that's the the terminology the Apostle John uses as well in his letters. In Revelation, however, this resurfaces again as Babylon, and we're told that in the future there will be a final renewal of this system and a final rebuilding of this city. So kind of like Wall Street, which refers to both a physical place and a financial system, or Hollywood that refers to an actual location, but also an an, uh, entertainment system. Babylon refers to a future city and a perennial system in the book of Revelation. And we were earlier given a brief introduction to it in in, uh, Revelation 14, 8 and 16, 19, but now we're given much more information in chapters 17 to 18, and specifically about its final role and final ruin in God's prophetic program. And so first of all, in chapter 17, we read about the coming dominance of Babylon the Great. 
Now, you remember that the bold judgments in chapter 16 are the, the final judgments that God will bring about on this rebellious world. A loud voice saying in verse 17, it is done. And so if the chronological order of John's prophecy continued, we would expect now at this point the second coming of Christ. But instead, we come to yet another pause in the prophecy, a final parenthetical section of the book that gives further revelation about this anti-God world system and how it's going to be during this time. And specifically, we find, first of all, in verses 1 to 2, that Babylon will seduce the whole world during this time. So verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. So one of the seven angels of wrath from chapter 16 invites the apostle John to see for himself in another prophetic vision the coming judgment of Babylon, right? That's where this this section is headed. But before that happens, he shows John that the multitudes of every nation and language symbolized by many waters here and later in verse 15 Along with, he says, every king, they will come under Babylon's evil influence. And notice the the graphic language used. Babylon is likened to a great prostitute with whom the peoples of the earth commit sexual immorality, uh, an Old Testament image that denotes gross idolatry and impurity. Probably the the best known example is the book of uh, Hosea where we see that. And so this is a a provocative picture of how the masses will will give themselves over to Babylon's false religion and moral destitution, leaving all of society in a kind of spiritual stupor. It says here, drunk with the intoxicating idolatries of the world. The very thing uh, spoken of in Jeremiah 51:7. Same image. There the prophet says, "Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunken. The nations drank of her wine, therefore the nations went mad." Now is not is that not the very same thing that's happening today, though to a, a lesser degree? I mean, just look at the the madness of many nations, the spiritual stupor in so many societies that have been seduced by this idolatrous spirit of Babylon. I mean, let's be honest, we even see this within many churches. We've all seen the statistics that professing evangelicals in North America today look almost the same and live almost the same as everyone else does especially having the same values, priorities, lifestyles, just with a little Jesus here and there. You know, even in more biblically sound churches, there's evidence of this seduction. Just think of the worldly entertainment many consume or the worldly immodest clothing many wear or the rampant materialism and consumerism many take part of without any thought at all. This should greatly concern all of us because, well, it's right for the church to be in the world. It is wrong for the world to be in the church. As Christ made very clear in John 17, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. A boat in water is good. That's what boats are for. However, water in a boat is bad. It causes the boat to sink. And so it is with the world when it is in the believer or in the church. And that's why we are called again and again in scriptures to not let any amount of the the godless system and values of society within ourselves, unawares, but rather we must be spiritually sensitive to the seduction of the world, the seduction of Babylon today, which will prevail in the end. 
more than ever, Babylon will seduce the whole world. But that's not all. We read on in verse 3 to 6 that Babylon will also subjugate the whole world. Verse 3, And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. So this is the, the dress of a prostitute at the time. Holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead, this is probably the headband that a prostitute would wear, was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So first we see the woman who represents Babylon, and she is sitting on the scarlet beast, the beast we met in chapter 13, that future wicked worldwide ruler who the New Testament has many names for, Antichrist, man of lawlessness. And this seems to signify that at least initially this this godless city and godless system called Babylon will have control over the beast, along with other kings and kingdoms of the time. And so with a a devious mixture of of beauty and blasphemy, of of allurements and abominations, as we see in verse 4, she will dominate humanity, reproducing her false religion around the world, as we see in verse 5 as well as repressing all who deny her. Verse 6 says, getting drunk with the blood of the saints. You know, there's one thing that the world system cannot tolerate. It's faithful Christians who opt out. They will inevitably be left out and kicked out of the world's associations and institutions. A man who had recently become a Christian went and Uh, asked the evangelist who had led him to the Lord, sir, now that I'm converted, must I give up the world? The evangelist answered, no, you haven't to give up the world, but if you give a good ringing testimony for the Son of God, the world will quickly give up on you. So true. Yet, Yet sometimes the response to the faithful is much worse, as it's been in the past and especially will be in the future when the blood of many martyrs will be shed. Okay, wherever there is gross idolatry and immorality, wherever that's embraced, God's people will come under persecution. In fact, more generally speaking, a culture of death will follow. As one commentator helpfully observes, because Babylonianism is driven by self-interest, it is willing to sacrifice others to promote its own benefits and prosperity. We see this across the globe today with abortion, euthanasia, genocide, and infanticide. Life is increasingly discounted at both beginning and end, as well as for the economically, ethnically, and socially marginalized. That will be true in the end as well, when Babylon will subjugate the whole world. But then finally, in the remainder of chapter 17, we also see that in the end, Babylon will surrender the whole world to the beast. So verse 7, when I saw her, I marveled greatly, but the angel said, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman. Mystery meaning there's this revelation that hasn't been given yet. And of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. Verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit or abyss and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth, and that's a term you remember throughout Revelation, is always talking about unbelievers, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. You remember, that's his fake death and fake resurrection. Verse 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. 
These are of one mind, and they, have hand over, they will hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For the Lord of lords, and he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. <clears throat> they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the world's words of God are fulfilled." And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Okay, so here's another summary of Antichrist's career. So verse 8, it says, He arises from the abyss, indicating that he'll be empowered by Satan right before then his ruin on earth. But, but between those main events, it says the godless will worship him as God. Remember we saw that in chapter 13. It says here, they will marvel because of his apparent resurrection. He was and is not and is to come. That's what that's talking about. However, before all of that, verse 9 to 10 says there will be seven successive kings and kingdoms. Kingdoms often represented as mountains in the Old Testament as it is here. And John sees that five of those kings and kingdoms have already fallen when this was written. So those would be the great Gentile empires of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Then there's these kings and kingdoms, the one that is, so that would be Rome when this was written, and the other that has not yet come. Well, we know from Daniel 2 and 7 and 8, that is this revived Roman empire that will come about in the end. Now then in verse 11 to 12, it says the beast and a confederation of 10 kings will come from out of that revived Rome and they will have their own eighth kingdom, which verse 14 says will in the end fight against the lamb and lose, but only after conquering the prostitute because the beast will just have no use for her anymore. At the midpoint of the, the seven-year tribulation, remember most of Revelation is the last three and a half years, at that midpoint, the Antichrist is going to want total control. And so Babylon will be raised and repurposed under his unilateral worldwide reign. That's essentially a summary of what we see here. It's complicated, I know. Might be difficult to get a hold of, but notice verse 17. It's all part of God's prophetic plan. It says the beast must have the royal power of Babylon until the words of God are fulfilled. So church, just as all things today and in all of history work according to God's will, every minute detail of anything that has ever happened, so it will be in the end. Even in this time of chaos and evil and war and bloodshed, all of it will be happening according to God's perfect plan. Which takes us now then to the second part of this vision in chapter 18. We've seen the coming dominance of Babylon the Great. Now we read about the coming destruction of Babylon the Great. Verse 1 of chapter 18, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. It's interesting, the word angel in its singular and plural form show up 67 times in the book of Revelation. Uh, these mighty messengers of God play a primary role in the prophetic vision of John. And often they, they show up radiating in this uh, stunning brilliance and beauty of their heavenly home. We see that here. In fact, on this occasion, it says the whole earth was made bright with this angel's glory, and possibly because the earth will be plunged into darkness by the fifth bowl judgment, as we saw last week in chapters 6 to 10. Now, it's likely that during the, the last three and a half years of great tribulation, once those have, uh, that that is passed, sorry, between chapters 17, remember the beast takes control of Babylon, and now chapter 18, when that's destroyed. Between those two chapters, probably close to three and a half years have passed. And so we quickly come, 
This quickly comes with the angelic announcement that follows. Verse 2. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from her pow power of her luxurious living." Now, we saw that same announcement in chapter 14, verse 8, where the Apostle John was given a summary of God's final judgment. This great city and this godless system are going to fall. There's no doubt about it. That's why fallen, fallen is repeated for emphasis. This is going to happen. Okay, so though the, the organized idolatry and immorality that began 4,000 years ago in Genesis 11 has continued on in world history, showing itself stronger at certain specific situations and, and more subtle in others, a day is coming when it will be over. Just as Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. John 12, 31, as he's pointing forward to the inevitable demise of Satan. You know, it may seem like this world will continue the way it is forever. And a lot of people live that way, right? The world's just going to keep on going exactly how it is. A dwelling place for the demonic and detestable, where, as we read earlier, the masses are, are maddened by gross idolatry and immorality, where the wicked just seem to grow wealthy, where the licentious live in luxury. But in the end, we're told in Revelation, time and again, it will fall. The self-centered, sensual, satanic system that influences culture, politics, education, economics, entertainment, every other facet of society, rewarding those who participate in it and punishing those who do not, this will come to a rapid ruinous end after reaching its zenith in the end times. And that is why God's people living at that time and for that matter, any other time, why we are called to separate from this system, as we read in verses four to five. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Throughout the Bible, God has told his people to leave the world, this system and society, lest they compromise. Abraham was told to leave his idolatrous country with his family in Genesis 12. Lot was told to leave the immoral city of Sodom with his family in Genesis 19. Moses was told to leave oppressive godless Egypt with the people in Exodus 8. The people were told to leave the men who rebelled in the wilderness in Numbers 16. And the nation was repeatedly told to leave Babylon later in Isaiah 48 and Jeremiah 50, 51. While the church was then likewise told to not have any partnership with the world and with unbelievers in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Therefore, go out from their midst. Be separate from them says the Lord. This is a common thread from the beginning to the end of Scripture. As we just read, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. It really couldn't be clearer. Church, this world system is our spiritual enemy. And yet so many of God's people Treat it like a harmless friend, entertaining its priorities, enjoying its pleasures like it's no big deal in the end, cozying up to the world's unbiblical vision and values, embracing its idea of the good life. When in fact, as James said, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Sure, someone will say, but doesn't the Bible say that God loves the world? And that as God's people, aren't we supposed to love the world too? 
Are we supposed to go into the world with the gospel? Well, absolutely. But scriptures differentiate between the, the sinful people of the world whom we are to reach with the gospel who need to be saved and the satanic system of the world that will one day be destroyed. And so, yeah, we're to be friends of sinners like Jesus was, but while remaining separate from their worldly values and worldly vision of human flourishing. In fact, it's by being different that we have something significant to offer them, a far better way of life in Christ. As 19th century pastor, preacher, evangelist, Charles Haddon Spurgeon observed, this was 150 years ago, put your finger on any prosperous age in church history and I will find a little marginal note reading thus, in this age, men could readily see where the church began and where the world ended. Never were there good times when the church and the world were joined in marriage. The more the church is distinct from the world in her acts and in her maxims, the more true is her testimony for Christ and the more potent is her witness against sin. Church, could it be that we are so very weak in our witness for Christ today for this very reason? Because we are no longer distinct from the world in any meaningful way, but rather we are clearly in love with the world, with all of its favors and riches and amusements and honor and protection and comfort and freedoms and rewards. First John 2, 15 to 17 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires but whoever does the will of God abides forever. This world's passing away. So why are we so fascinated with it? Why are so many so in love with the things of this world? It's going to pass away and we're told exactly what that's going to look like now in verses 6 to 8. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds, mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burnt up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God, who has judged her. What's in store for the future godless city and this perennial godless system is severe. Its glory and luxury are going to be replaced, it says, with torment and mourning. And notice it's going to happen in a single day, which should remind the reader of how the Babylonian empire of Daniel's day, do you remember? It also passed in one day through the surprise attack of Darius the Mede, as we read in Daniel 5. This Babylonian royalty, they were having this great big party. They were just living it up in luxury. And then they were conquered just like that in a single day. And so will it be for Babylon the Great at the end of days. Only her downfall will be much more brutal and bloody than ever before. As one author points out, the enormity of Babylon's sin now brings about the enormity of God's judgment. It is the law of retribution, sometimes called lex talionis. Divine justice exacts the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But the voice John hears demands that the law of retribution be doubled in payment of Babylon's hideous sins. She mixes a cup of sin that nations will drink down to the full, so she is given a double cup 
of divine judgment to drink. This is the final frightening fate of this city and this system called Babylon. As we read in verse 8, she will be burnt up with fire along with all who commit spiritual adultery with her. If you remember in chapter 14, verse 9 to 10, what we read there. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, right, those who pledge allegiance to the beast and to this Babylonian system, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And that takes us to the final part of chapter 18 here. Before those who give themselves to Babylon are destroyed, there's going to be a coming distress over Babylon the Great. You know, one of the ways you can determine what a person truly loves is by what they weep over. If they're heartbroken over the loss of something, that's what they've given their heart to. And so when I do a funeral and I see the family devastated by the loss of a loved one, I know they had given their heart to the deceased. Their hurt reveals their heart. But in the same way, when I see someone devastated by the loss of worldly comfort, by the loss of worldly security, by the loss of worldly power, by the loss of worldly freedom, I also know they have given their heart to the world. Their hurt demonstrates, reveals their heart. And so it will also be for those who give their heart to the world in the great tribulation, who commit spiritual adultery with Babylon the Great in her final days, as we'll now see. First of all, we see in verse 9 and 10 that the powerful in Babylon will weep over its ruin. Verse 9, and the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. We saw earlier in chapter 17, verse 2, that the kings of the earth will commit spiritual adultery with Babylon, the great prostitute, and no doubt will gain political power through her. Well, three and a half years later, it says they will see her burning, and they will then weep and wail over her, because it will mean their rule is over. It will mean their luxury is no longer placing their hearts in this great city, putting their hope in this mighty city, when it all comes crashing down, they will come crashing down with it. Like so many throughout history who have gained power by aligning themselves with evil empires or associating themselves with leaders of so little character, only to see them fall and then fall with them. The powerful in Babylon will weep over its ruin, but so will the prosperous. Verse 11, and the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myth, frank, uh, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is human souls, all of the Luxury of wealthy living at that time. Verse 14, the fruit of which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and all your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and pearls. For in a single hour, all the wealth has been laid waste. And all the shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea stood afar and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? 
And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour, she has been laid to waste. So in great detail, John sees the many stakeholders of this godless city and system will become unimaginably prosperous until, just like that, it says in a single hour, all this wealth will be laid waste. The delicacies their souls longed for and that what they lived for will be gone and never found again. All that they accumulated will be nothing. And they too, it says, will be utterly devastated. I think of the stockholders and shareholders who lost everything in the market crash of 1929 that sparked the Great Depression. You've maybe seen those pictures where some of them were jumping out of buildings because they were so distressed. But then finally we see it's not just the powerful and prosperous, but it's all the the partakers of Babylon who will weep over its ruin in the end. The final verses, verse 20 to 24. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and all who have been slain on the earth. So when the city and system of Babylon finally falls, when martyrs and saints, it says, what will they do? Verse 20, they will rejoice because they will finally be avenged. Remember, that's what they were praying for in chapter 6, 9, and 11. And it says there will be a party in heaven. While on earth, it says the party will be over. Everything, did you notice this? Everything glad and good will be gone. The carefree sights and sounds that once filled this great godless city, Babylon, it will be no more. Do you, did you, did you hear that in, in verses 21 to 23? Six times, it'll be no more, no more, no more, emphasizing total destruction. Once and for all, God will wipe off the face of the earth. It'll be thrown down with violence like a millstone thrown in a sea likely a fulfillment of Jeremiah 51, 63 that says, when you finish reading this book, tie a stone to it and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates and say, thus shall Babylon sink to rise no more because of the disaster that I am bringing upon her and they shall become exhausted. And that again will cause those who gave their hearts to her great grief. Jeremiah 50, 46 at the sound of the capture of Babylon, the earth shall tremble, and her cry shall be heard among the nations. There will be a great coming distress over the destruction of Babylon. Now, as I read those verses this past week, I couldn't help but wonder what would our response be if the world as we know it today? suddenly came to an end? Would we weep and wail if the world economy suddenly crashed? Or if the world social order suddenly changed? Or if the world political structure suddenly collapsed? How would we feel if Wall Street and what it represents was suddenly no more? Or if Hollywood and what it represents was suddenly no more. Or if Washington, D.C. and what it represents was suddenly no more. Maybe the closest parallel to future Babylon in the 21st century. The center of organized idolatry and immorality today. Just as Rome was the center of that system in the first century when this book was originally written. No doubt these early Christians asking these same questions. 
You know, how we answer these questions shows what we truly love, where we've placed our hearts, whether they've been captured by the world or whether they are captivated by the word of God whether they've been given over to the great prostitute or whether we are given over to the prayer and the praise and the proclamation of the gospel, whether they've been seduced by Babylon or separated unto the body of Christ. And so in closing, I just want to exhort all of us to be asking these questions of ourselves this week so that we might take very seriously, again, the angel's exhortation, the one exhortation in this passage, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. Listen, Babylon is going to fall. Its idolatrous and immoral system is going to crash, and the world as we know it will be no more. But there is coming another world, a world that will never end a pure and perfect world we're going to see in the coming weeks. And so let us fall in love anew with that world which is to come. Let's daily give our hearts over to the coming king. And let's be ever more captivated, not by the seductions of Babylon, but the beauty of the bridegroom Christ, who is coming again for his faithful bride in the end until Babylon loses all of its appeal. And we don't weep when it falls, we rejoice. Let's pray that God would do that work in our hearts today. Lord God, you know our hearts and you know how easily we are seduced by the world system that opposes you, by the values and vision of the good life that it presents to us in opposition to you and your word. And you know, Lord, that we can so easily love the things of this world. And so I pray, Lord, that you would rather cause us to fall in love more and more with the world to come and with the King who is to come, Christ. So that, as we sang before, the things of earth would grow dim in the light of your glory and grace. Give us a greater love for you, Lord Jesus so that we might live distinct lives for your glory now and forever in Jesus' name. Amen.